All right, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so um, the, the mini exam one was due today at 1 p.m. So I'm looking right now in the Dropbox folder. It looks like I have six submissions. So I'm gonna close this out now. So mini exam one is like officially done. So if you didn't do it, that's okay. You have what, another eight to choose from. And I also sent out an email um last week with those problems to do um and i didn't set a due date right so um if you're going to use that as a mini exam I'll, I'll i'll decide on the due date um soon i'm thinking i'm thinking maybe next next wednesday i just don't want you to drag it out too long because you've got other stuff to worry about so let's just say tentatively it'll be the 17th that that would be due at 1 p.m right before class Okay, um, any questions before we begin today's material? We're good? Sure. All right, so 10.6 is a section where what we're gonna do is <clears throat> establish kind of a baseline for the types of, some of the types of surfaces that we're going to encounter in this class. So it's kind of like, you know, coming in here, everybody knows what a parabola looks like. Everyone knows what a, you know, certain graphs of certain functions look like. Well, now what we're going to be doing is looking at the graphs of some surfaces that we have to be comfortable with before we can proceed in three-dimensional space doing calculus. So we're still building up to the eventual calculus part of this class, which will start in the next section, we'll start getting into the calculus. So um, still kind of building the foundation at this point. So with, uh, with that said, let's get into cylinders and quadratic surfaces. So the first thing is a review, all right? So we wanna talk about what we, what we know from two-dimensional space. So in two-dimensional space, we have these general shapes that we should know what their equations look like. So if you see x squared plus y squared equals r squared, we should all know that that's a circle. We should all know that it's centered at the origin. It actually comes from the more general equation of a circle in two-dimensional space. This is the equation of a circle in, in two-dimensional space, but here the center is hk. If we take h and make it zero and k zero, then we get this equation. So, um, of course, the radius um, just controls, you know, how big the circle is, right? So we're all okay with that. All right. Then we have the next thing we need to be comfortable with. You know what? Let me point something out on this. On the circle, if we're in two-dimensional space, right? Two-dimensional space. What makes a circle equation a circle equation is that it contains both x and y, right? They're both being squared. And then we have some constant. That'll be our radius, you know, whatever our radius squared is, that'll be some constant. So you've got two variables, both of them are quadratic, and you've got a number, equals a number. That's what makes a circle a circle in two dimensional space. So we're gonna, in this section, we're gonna be keeping track of things like how many variables do we see? which of them are squared, things like that, all right? So let's look at another equation. So this is a, an ellipse, the equation of an ellipse. So the difference between a circle and an ellipse equation, you still have x is being squared, you still have y is being squared, but now you're dividing each of these by constants. And so here's an example, x squared over four, plus y squared over nine equals one. 
So that would give you an ellipse. So two variables, both of them are squared. We have addition between them, but, but now you have numbers underneath. Now you might think to yourself, okay, well, couldn't I turn this into a circle? Like maybe I just clear the denominators. Like multiply everything by 36, right? So let's see, 36 here, 36 here. And let's see what happens. We get nine X squared plus, uh, let's see, four Y squared equals 36. Well, this is not the equation of a circle because you have, in order to be a circle, you have to have ones here. You have to have a coefficient of one. So this is not like a circle with radius six, all right? So an ellipse is very different than a circle, unless, unless the A and the B are the same numbers. So like if I change this, let's say I change this to nine, okay? Then, then obviously when I multiply through, um, I would have multiplied by nine then, cleared the fractions out, let me just get rid of that. Uh, clear the fractions out, we get x squared plus y squared equals nine. And then that is a circle. So in the case that a and b are the same numbers, then you get a circle. But if they're different, then you're going to get the ellipse. And so, you know, this just can, the a and the b just controls the shape of the ellipse. If the, if the b squared is bigger than the a squared, then the ellipse is going to be taller than it is wide, right? If the a squared is bigger than the b squared, then it's going to be wider than it is tall, right? Okay, we good? Any questions? All right. The next thing we should know is a hyperbola. So a hyperbola is almost the same as an ellipse, isn't it? With one exception, we have minus instead of plus, and that changes everything. We no longer get this closed curve. We get this weird kind of, well, it's called a hyperbola, right? So it's two curves, they're, they're, almost like parab they're almost like parabolas that are facing opposite directions. And if we can you know, adjust the A and the B, that will adjust the shape of this, okay? Now notice that the ones we have right now, they look, they look like this, right? And that's because we have X squared minus Y squared. If we were to change it, and we had the y squared over, let's say four minus the x squared over, let's go with 16 or something like that equals one, then it would look like this, okay? So if the subtraction is on the y, then it's almost like you have this symmetry axis, axis down the middle, okay, along the y axis. If the subtraction is on the x, then you have this symmetry axis kind of running parallel to the x-axis. Make sense? I realize a lot of you have seen this. It's just usually you see this like in pre-cal, right? So it's it's been a while since you looked at these things called conic sections. That's what these are. So let's go. All right. Okay, so now we want to step out of two-dimensional space and into three-dimensional space. So in three-dimensional space, what we want to look at are equations that have x, y, and z in, in them, okay? So any equation that has three variables in it, now there's a little catch to that. You actually don't need to have all three in the equation. You can have just x and y, or you could have just y and z, or just x and z, or you could have all of them. It just depends. The main key is that we want to fixate into three-dimensional space. We wanna realize we're in 3D now, okay? We're in 3D. So doing drawing these things by hand is not necessarily something easy to do, all right? Especially before computers, before we could animate things or you know, visualize things in three-dimensional space, it was very difficult to, to um, graph these things. So what we did is we used these things called traces or trace curves. And I'll show you how to do it in a second. But before I do that, let me just kind of go back. Let's, let's say we wanted to do, uh, let's say we wanted to do this and we're in two dimensional space, okay? If we wanted to graph this in two dimensional space, then one thing we could do, all right, to try and graph this is we could say, all right, let's just let X be zero. Okay, if X is zero, then what do we get? 
Let's see, we get negative y squared over nine equals one. And if I try and solve that, negative y squared equals nine, that has no solution, right? There's no solution that I can't square something, make it negative and then make that nine. So this would have no solution. So that would tell me that my graph does not exist anywhere along the y axis, right? When x is zero. And then I could keep trying different values of x until I get something that, that works. So I could do something like, let's let x be, I don't know, let's let x be 36. And you know what? No, let's not let it be 36. Let's let it be six, okay? So if x is six, then what would we get? We plug into the equation. We get 36 over four minus y squared over nine equals one. And then that would be nine minus uh, y squared. Are y'all with me or not? You just plugging things in. Okay, and then I can just try and clean this up. I can move the nine to the other side. Negative y squared over nine equals negative eight. So I subtracted both sides, uh, subtracted nine. And then here, I can multiply by negative nine on both sides. If I do that, I get y squared equals neg uh, positive 72. So I just multiply both sides by negative nine here. And that's gonna have two solutions, right? Two solutions, positive square root of 72, negative square root of 72. So that means if I go out to six, right? I go up and I'm gonna have a point and I go down, I have a point. And if we put all these together, we would eventually get, get that hyperbola, all right? But the, the way we graph by hand is to just fix one of the variables and then solve for the other one, right? We're gonna continue that. We're gonna use something like that when we try and graph something in 3D. So that was just to remind you, if you didn't know what this looked like, you have ways of doing it, of, of actually graphing it. All right, so let's get to our first quadratic surface or, or one of our first surfaces in three-dimensional space. And this is called a cylinder. And we're, we've all seen cylinders, right? It's like a beer can. So the thing about cylinders is that these things that we're calling traces, all the traces that we make of a cylinder create circles and lines. Now, right now, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about, all right? But that's what makes a cylinder a cylinder is that anytime you do a trace of it, you get a circle or a line. Okay, so let's take a look at, look at the general um, equation and go from there. So here it is, here's a cylinder, all right? Here's a cylinder. Now you have, to, you have to understand that that cylinder goes infinitely, okay? This cylinder goes up infinitely, right? Just keeps going forever up and forever down, okay? But I have to stop somewhere here. So here's our cylinder. And so if, if you look at the equation of this cylinder, what you have is x squared, and this is down on the bottom, you'll see that down there? It's x squared plus y squared equals c squared. So notice that that's the same equation of a, as a circle, isn't it? But see, we're in three-dimensional space now. So what you have here, since z does not appear in this equation, we say z is free. It's called a free variable. And that means if, if I am, am looking at all the points that satisfy the, the equation, I could start out by just, let's just plug in a value for C. Let's let C be one, okay? Then this is the, the equation we have is X squared plus Y squared equals one, right? Okay, so we know that that's a circle of radius one, right? It's all the points that will lie on the circle of radius one. But remember all the points, that would satisfy that would have to have an X coordinate. So let me just give you an example, one, a Y coordinate that would work, zero. Do you all agree that that would satisfy this equation? But my Z can be anything, right? My Z can be anything I want it to be. So if my Z can be anything I want it to be, I can make it zero. And that would be a point like this, X is one. So I come out one on my X axis. I don't go, I don't go anywhere on the Y axis. So I stay there and on the Z, I just, I just draw a dot there, that point right there. But I could have very well have done one, zero, one, like that. And then I would have a point up one. 
And I could have done two, right? And that would give me another point or three or four or negative one or negative two. And all of those points lie on a straight line, don't they? Okay, yes, yes. All right, so let's, let's back up. If I'm trying to figure out what this looks like in three-dimensional space, then what I could do is I could fix y to be equal to, let's say, zero. That's what we did here, right? Zero, zero, right? If I do that, that implies then that x squared must equal one. So then x must be plus or minus one when you take the square root. Now, x equals plus or minus one means, again, we could be here at this dot. Let me change colors. We could be here at this dot, or we could be at negative one, which is in the back, right? On the back side of the x-axis. And then our z is free. So what we get is that right there, those two lines. Is that making sense? Could have done the same thing for, uh, for, for the uh, y. I could have fixed x to be 0. If I do that, then y has to be plus or minus 1. And my z is free. So that would give me this line here. And then on the other side, it's, it's starting to get messy, right? You, you with me? All right. So now that we've kind of established that, I want to talk to you a little bit about the trace curves because this is this isn't really the trace curves. So I want us I want us to start thinking trace curves. Um, so the way trace curves work is going to be this: what we want to imagine doing is taking the coordinate planes and slicing through our surface. So we have three coordinate planes. We have the x y plane. Okay. We have the yz plane. And we talked about this in the very beginning of class. Then we have the xz plane. When we first started talking about three dimensional space. So the xy plane, right? The xy plane is the ground. It's mine. There it is. Okay, so there's the ground, right? So can you all see that we actually intersect that surface in a circle, right? So when you're on the x, y plane, z is zero. That's what that means, right? Z is zero. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying, let's let z be zero. Okay, let's let z be zero and let's write the equation down. Well, that doesn't change the equation, right? So if z is zero, I'm going to draw a circle of radius one, and that is this circle right here. That's called a trace curve, and you see, everyone see it's a circle, right? Then I, I bring in another plane that's parallel to the xy plane. So let's try, how about z is one? So now your z is one. That's still parallel to the xy plane, isn't it? Just up one. And so if you do that, that has no impact on the equation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move up one. I'm going to move my plane up one. OK, that's now z is one. Do you all see I moved that up? And now I'm going to draw another, another circle there, right? So I get another circle right there. And then I keep doing that with various, uh, various values of z, and I get all these circular traces. So now I'll show you, yeah, I guess that's good. I, th I think that's okay. So if you put those circular traces together, you can kind of see it starts to form the cylinder, right? Okay, so that's the xy plane. Let's talk about the yz plane. So we're talking about a plane that looks like mm, sorry. YZ, so here's a YZ. Let me take this out and oh, there we go. Okay, 
Okay, so I'm gonna go through this a little faster. If when we're doing the YZ plane, that's, that means that <clears throat> we're going to fix what variable, what variable are we fixing if we're talking about the YZ plane? X. X, right? So if we let X, the YZ plane itself is X is zero, right? So if X is zero, let's plug that into the equation. We get zero squared plus Y squared equals one. So now you get Y is plus or minus one. So if X is zero, that's the YZ plane. Our Y coordinate must be plus or minus one. And what about our Z coordinate? Infinite free. Yeah, it's free, right? So it can be anything. So I, I need to um, erase some stuff here. Let me erase those. So can you can you all see where I, I'm doing several? I'm doing two planes at the same time. These are both parallel to the YZ plane. I'm having some problems with my code. I can't get one plane, but hopefully you can see that where they hit the the cylinder, we get these vertical lines, right? We get vertical lines. And so now I'll show you, I'm gonna show you both of these together. Oh, well, you know what? We'll keep those there. What about the, uh, the XZ plane? Here we let Y be zero now, right? And if we do that, we get X squared equals one. So we get X is plus or minus one. And so those are other, those are different lines, right? Those are different. That's when we come in and we hit it with planes that go in that direction. So if I put all, whoa, oops. If I put all of this together, if I put all of this together, even the XY plane, right? Any plane parallel to the XY plane, right? Any of those together with all of the, the planes that are parallel to the YZ and the XZ, no matter how you do this, you're always going to intersect in vertical lines or circles, no matter how you do it. Follow? That's what makes a cylinder a cylinder. Traces are circles and lines. All right, are there any questions? Because I'm gonna move on. Now, the way that I look at cylinders is this. Okay, because I'm not a big fan of traces. I have to show you how they're done, but I'm not a big fan. The way I look at it is this. I look at the equation. Let me clear all this out of here. I look at the equation of a cylinder. And I remember that I'm in R3. And I say to myself, okay, look, I've got two variables, X and Y, they're both square, they're both being added equals a number. That's a circle in R2, right? That's a circle in two dimensional space. Since Z is free, this is just going to be a circle that's allowed to be moved up and down the Z axis. And so you get a cylinder that's just pointed up and down the Z axis. That's it, right? Simple enough. Now, what if we change it though? Because we have three variables to work with here. So what if we change it now? And this time our equation looks like this, X squared plus Z squared equals C squared. So now you're missing the Y, right? You're missing the Y. So what you're gonna have is a circle. I'll give you a specific example. Say we had that. X squared plus Z squared equals nine and we're in R3. Remember, we have to be in R3. Then what you're gonna have is a circle of radius three in the X, Z plane. So here's your, here's your X axis, here's your Z axis. So in the X, Z plane, we have a circle. So if I turn this and look at it like this, kind of like from that direction, the X, Z plane, we've got circles, right? But the thing is they're free to move along the Y axis coming towards us and, and then away from us. So that creates the cylinder down the Y axis, right? So whichever variable is free is the direction in which your cylinder is gonna be going down. Simple enough? Of course, there's one more we could have, right? We could have the X be free. And then if we free up the X, then it's gonna come down the X axis. That's this scenario. Okay, but we still have circles and lines when you talk about the, the traces. All right, cylinder, 
Done, put it away, we're good. We're looking for two variables squared, addition sign between them equals a number. We're in R3, that's a cylinder. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so it just goes on infinitely in whichever variable is free, it just goes on forever? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Okay. Yep. Now, if we did something like this, like for this particular example, if we put y squared plus z squared equals 100, let's say, and then I said x is between, let's say, um, negative 10 to 10. Now I've left, this is a cylinder, we're in R3, right? So we're, we've got a cylinder, right? X is free here. However, it's not completely free. I'm restricting X between negative 10 and 10, which means I think that's what I have in this picture. You, if I turn it, yeah. It looks like X, I maxed it out at 10 here, right? So this is exactly the cylinder that stops here and goes to that back edge. And remember, it's just the shell of the cylinder, right? It's not all this junk inside. It's not like a solid bar, right? It's just a shell. That's what we're looking at. How do you think I can make it solid? You would add a third dimension? Uh, it wouldn't be that hard. Right here on that, I just make an inequality, less than or equal to 100. And then what that does is it draws all the circles that it draws every circle. Well, right now this, you need to understand from that, that your radius is 10, right? Cause that's R squared. So that would draw a circle of radius 10 and then everything down all the way to zero. Okay. And so that would fill in all these little circles all through here and fill in all of that, make it a disc. And then your X varies between negative 10 and 10. So that just goes in both directions and it fills this whole thing up and makes it a solid bar. Any other questions? We, we'll deal with that later. We don't need that right now because a solid bar is not a surface. And right now we're just talking about surfaces. So right now, what you want us to look at or think about more than anything is the shape of the cylinder or the actual uh, traces. I want you to think more about the shape and then how the equation tells us what we're looking at, okay? So I need everyone here to understand that when we're in three-dimensional space, if you have an equation that has two variables in it that are squared and that they're being added together and that equals a number, basically the equation of a circle, right? that in three-dimensional space, that's a cylinder. And whichever variable does not appear is the, is the axis that your cylinder goes down. And of course, we could figure out the radius and all that, but um, that's the main thing I want you to, to be able to do is look at this and determine what we're looking at. Because I believe there's like seven or eight different surfaces we have to look at here. So they're all gonna have little differences. Is that okay? Um, Any other? Uh, are we also going to see uh, elliptical kind of cylinders, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yep, ellipsoids. Yep, we're going to have lots of different things here. Say that the missing variable was not free, would that make a sphere? If you had, you mean x squared plus y squared uh, plus z squared, if we had that yeah. in there, then you'd have a sphere. Yep, and we've already talked about those, so I'm glad you brought that up. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a number squared right, is something we've already discussed. That would be sphere, of, right? It would be a sphere radius 10. The shell, right, the outer shell. But we've done that, right? So if we ever see x, y, and z all together in one equation, all of them squared, all of them added equals a number, we've got a sphere. And the, the traces for those would all be circles? They would all be circles, yep. No matter which way you cut it, right? If you cut it with an XY plane or a YZ plane or an XZ plane, you're always gonna have circles. Okay. Good. Okay, let's look at the next, next type of surface. The next one is called a parabolic cylinder. And as you might, 
expect a parabolic cylinder, when you do traces, you're gonna get parabolas and lines. So when you cut insert, like when you cut it with the X, Y plane, you, you might get parabolas. When you cut it with the Y, Z plane, you might get lines. Those are the two things we get though. So let's look at it first, all right? Here's what a parabolic cylinder looks like. It's, it's just a sheet of paper that's folded up like a parabola. That's all it is, right? That's all it is. So what's the equation of this? Well, it's gonna look, it's gonna look pretty ridiculous. It's z equals cx squared. Okay, so notice in that equation, I'll give you a specific example, z equals 4x squared. That's a specific example of a parabolic cylinder. You have here two variables, right? X and Y. Only the X is squared. The Z is linear, not squared, right? And the Y is missing. The Y is free. So what that tells you is that you're going to have a parabola. When you look at it from, from the perspective, when you put yourself on the, this is always really hard for me to do here. When you put yourself like right down the Y axis, like you're standing on the Y axis looking down and you see the X, Y, X, X, Z plane down there, you have a parabola, okay? So it's just a parabola, but because your Y is free, the parabolas can come towards you and away from you. And so that's why you get the whole thing. Now, let me show you what these traces look like. Every time I do a cut, See, if I cut it with an XZ plane, I'm going to, no matter where I am, oops, wrong one, no matter where I am, right, I'm gonna have parabolas. If I cut it with the XY plane, which is the ground, and I bring that up, you see that as I bring that up, I'm gonna hit this surface and it's gonna be lines. And then if I cut it with that plane, let me take the others out of there. Cut it with planes going that way, right? Almost like vertically, I'm gonna have lines there also. So what do you need to know? You need to know that when you see two variables, one of them is square, the other one is not, right? You've got a parabola, but because the third variable is free, it creates the whole sheet, that surface, which is the parabolic cylinder. Now here, y is free, right? I'm sorry, yeah, y is free. So we could have two other variations of this, couldn't we? We could have z equals, I'll do a different example, nine y squared where x is free. So that would look like a parabola, but it would, come, it would be going back and forth along the x-axis instead. I could also have what, like x equals, I was just say y squared, z is free, oops. So let's, let's do, the, well, I could keep on going, right? Let me show you, I've got it in the notes. So we'll do that one by hand in a second. So here are the different combinations of what we could have. We could have z equals a constant times x squared where y is free. So now we got a parabola going down the y-axis. Here we have z equals some constant times y squared where x is free, now it's coming down the x-axis. All right, so that's two possibilities. We could have x equals some constant times y squared where z is free. So now you've got a parabola going up and down the z-axis, but the parabola is actually in the, uh, it's upside down, I know, but it's in the y-x y plane and then here's a different variation, all right? So I don't want you to get so fixated on drawing these. I want you to just understand that by looking at the equation, you should have an idea of what it is, all right? And be able to distinguish it from, let's say a sphere or a traditional cylinder. And we, have, we still have two other possibilities here. We could have y equals, x squared or y equals z squared. So all these different, all these different things that can happen. So let's, let's go and do this one here. Let's try and sketch this using traces, 
all right? And this just, I hate traces, all right? So here's where I'm gonna start. I'm gonna do first traces that, where I use the XY plane. So when I mean, what I mean by that is I'm gonna use different, I'm gonna use the XY plane and just move it up and down. So I'm gonna use different values of Z. So let me start out with Z equals zero. If Z equals zero, what does that equation turn into? Four X squared equals zero. Yeah, four X squared equals zero, which means that X has to be what? Zero, zero isn't it? Yeah, zero. Now, what about Y? Y is not in there, right? So Y is free. Y is free. So basically, here's what I have. I have ordered pairs that look like this. I have my Z is zero because that's what I said, right? That forces X to be zero. And then this right here, I'm just gonna put um, Y because it's free. So what does that look like? In three dimensional space, what would that look like? If this is X, this is Y, and this is Z, what would all the points where X is zero, Z is zero, and Y is free look like? Anything moving down the Y line? Yeah, it's just everything on the Y axis. That's what it is. So that point would work, that point would work, that point would work. So it's my entire Y axis. So I know that that right there is part of the graph. Shit, that sucks. Okay, sorry about that. Let me try it again. I'll just do one line. Uh, okay, there we go. That line lives on my thing, right? And it goes forever in both directions. Okay, so now I try a different one. So let's do a different a different trace. Let's go with uh, what, Z equals, I'll make it easy. Let's go Z is four, so our numbers are nice. So Z is four, so if I plug that in, I get four X squared equals four. Do y'all agree? Yeah. Now, if I solve this for X, I should get plus or minus one. Do I need to show that or are we good? Pretty good. Okay, so let's look at all these points. This is all the points where Z is four, X can be plus or minus one and Y is free. Okay, so let me, let me look at those. Let's start with X being positive one. So X is positive one, here's one. I have to go out one and then my, my Z has to be four. So I have to go up four here, one, two, three, four. So here's where I am. And then my Y can be free, right? So now I have another line that runs parallel to the, to the Y axis. So it's like that. Uh, I don't want two of them. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, there. Okay. But I could also have done the negative one there. The negative one would have taken me to the other side. So I would have gone negative one on X. Then I would have gone up four, one, one, two, three, four right there. And then I would have had a line going like that. I realize this is hard to see, but here's what we're building. We're building this one right here. Let me take all this crap out of here. Okay, this is the one we're building right here. We had we had the uh, we had the y-axis down there, right? And we just came up with two lines on here. That's what we just did. Do you see how this could suck to have to do this and just keep going until you figure out what this thing looks like? Okay, but we're, I'm gonna keep going. So we could do more of those. Um, let, me, let me try a different plane. How about we do, how about the XZ plane? Let's do the XZ plane. Okay, if I do XZ plane, things that are parallel to it, the X, the X, uh oh, oh, I know what's going. On. The X Z plane. That's Y equals zero, isn't it? That's one of them. So if Y is zero, what does this equation become? Z equals four X squared. There is no Y in there, right? So we need to understand what this looks like. You know, I think everyone in here knows what Y equals four X squared looks like, right? Back in college algebra so it's a parabola that opens up the four in front kind of stretches it out makes it a little like taller not not as wide 
but that would be in the x, y plane. Here, because our two variables are z and x, it would be in the x, z plane. And so this is where things get tough. You, you have to try and draw this now. I'm gonna use a different color. So in the x, z plane, I know that that point's there. And I know I've gotta go up and go through that point. And I know I've gotta go through and do that, right? And notice that all those points, well, it's hard, hard to see it, but all of these points, y is zero. But then I could have done y is one, right? And it wouldn't change anything. So that, you know, move out to the right one on the y-axis and draw me another problem. Or go negative one on the y-axis and draw me another problem. And you start putting all these together and you wind up getting your whatever, right? This is, not a, this is not a drawing class, okay? So we're not sitting here trying to make a perfect thing. We're just trying to, we're trying to be able to look at the equation and know the shape of what we're working with, all right? Any questions? Traces are no fun, yeah? All right, we're moving along. Next one, ellipsoid, okay? Anytime you have an ellipsoid, all your traces are ellipses. No matter whether it be the xy plane, yz plane, xz plane, doesn't matter which way you cut it, you're always going to have an ellipse. So it's an egg, right? It's just an egg. That's all it is. Three-dimensional egg. Now, how would we know we're looking at an ellipse? Ellipsoid, sorry. Well, look at the equation. Isn't that the same as an ellipse equation with one thing added, right? This is ellipse, take that out. Tell me you're in two dimensional space, right? And you're in an ellipse. You add, you add the z squared over c squared and now you've got an ellipsoid, it's three dimensional. So we have all three variables here. All three of them are squared. There's addition between all of them. They're all divided by some numbers and we've got equals one. That's what makes an ellipsoid an ellipsoid. A specific example. There, that would be an ellipsoid. You cannot clear the denominator and create a sphere, okay? You can't. Just like I showed you earlier, you can't make an ellipse into a circle unless all the numbers on the bottom are the same. Same thing goes here. If A, B, and C are all the same numbers, then you're looking at a sphere. So an ellipsoid is just kind of a contorted sphere. That's all it is, right? Uh, let's just look at the, uh, the traces. So if I cut it with an XY plane, does everyone see the, uh, everyone see that we would cut here? That would create an ellipse there. And if we cut it with another plane, like the YZ plane, something like that, then we're gonna get an ellipse there. That ellipse would go more, oh, shoot, I forgot, sorry, I forgot to, I have to switch back and forth between two things here. Uh, let me do this. Let me just clear that out. Um, let me clear that out. That would be our ellipse right there. And then you could do the other plane too. I'm not going to, but here's, here's all of them kind of together. So here's what all the XY plane slices would look like. A bunch of ellipses going that way. And then if you cut it the, this way, you've got ellipses that way. And if you cut it the other way, you got ellipses that way. Do y'all see how that all works? Ellipses in every pretty, pretty much um, every direction. Well, the three different directions, all right? By the way, these planes we're cutting it with, they're always the parallel to the XY plane, YZ plane, or XZ plane. They're never some arbitrary plane, right? It's never just arbitrary. It's always parallel to the XY, parallel to the XZ, or parallel to the YZ. All right, moving on. We don't wanna do this, right? We don't wanna do traces on this. Do you feel like drawing? I don't, but let's just see how it would work. I mean, I'm not gonna write anything down, but if, let's say we wanted to do um, the XY plane slices, right? 
If I do the x, y plane, then I'm gonna set z to zero, right? If you set z to zero, this is gone. And so you're just drawing this thing, x squared plus y squared over four equals one. Well, those are ellipses, right? So you're just gonna draw a bunch of ellipses and you're gonna let the z vary. So you're just gonna let z move up and down. I mean, sorry, you're not gonna let z, that's with z being zero, right? That's with z being zero. But if you change z to let's say one, that's still gonna give you a number right there. You just move it to the other side and then you draw a new ellipse. Do I need to go through that? I, I'm not gonna test you on, on sketching traces. I'm not gonna test you on it. What I'm gonna test you on is I give you an equation, you tell me what it is. That's, that's what I'm more interested in. So can I move on without doing traces on this? Okay, if you wanna do traces, come to my office hours, we'll do traces. I'll make you do traces. Elliptic paraboloids. So an elliptic paraboloid is a, is a surface where your traces are ellipses and parabolas. It's hard to imagine what that would be. You have ellipses and parabolas when you're cutting. It's really hard to maybe visualize that. So here it is. Let me show you. If we cut it with XY plane, we get a bunch of ellipses, right? If we cut it with YZ plane, do you see that we get a bunch of parabolas? If we look from the side, those just look like a bunch of parabolas. And then if we cut it with XZ planes, we get parabolas in the other direction. All right, as we hit here, move through here, we're always gonna hit in a parabola. So how will you know that you're looking at this thing, right? So how do you know that you're looking at an elliptic paraboloid? Well, here's the equation down here. So what you have are all three variables, right? Two of them are squared and divided by numbers. The third variable is on the other side and it's not squared and it's over a number. So let me give you a specific example. X squared over four plus Y squared over nine equals, let's just say Z. I could say z, that's z over one, right? So how are you going to know that that's, let's see, we have no free variables, right? Nothing is free here. But one of them is, one of them is not squared. And do you, do you see that the one that's not squared, the z is kind of the axis that our, that our elliptic paraboloid goes up? Do you all see that? Like this is a big bowl and the bowl just keeps going up the z-axis. So whatever variable is here is the, is the direction of the bowl. So that means we could have an elliptic paraboloid in two other directions, right? Couldn't we? Let's see it in two other directions. Here it is, here's an elliptic paraboloid x squared over a squared plus z squared over b squared equals y over c. See, the, the y is not squared, and so the bowl goes out the y-axis. And then we could have same thing, y squared over a squared plus z squared over b squared equals x over a constant. And here, x is the one that's not squared, so the bowl is going to come out the x-axis. OK? All right, next one, the hyperbolic paraboloid. So your traces are hyperbolas and parabolas. Hyperbolas and parabolas. Hyperbolic paraboloid, here it is. Whoa, okay, this is starting to look weird now. I, I always like to think of a hyperbolic paraboloid as, as like a saddle, okay? Let me, let me, I'm afraid to type horse saddle in here, but I will. Yeah, there we go. I think that that's a benign picture to look at. Okay, so you've got like the curve of the saddle in one direction is like a parabola, almost that goes up. But in the other direction, it's curved down. Does that kind of make sense? So that's kind of what we have here. It's 
It's hard to do this. Maybe I can, let me change the shape of this. Let me make it, yeah, there we go. What is saying slowing down. Okay, so maybe that's a little easier to see the saddle. Can you all see that saddle? And actually later on in this class, we're actually gonna find that point right there. It's called the saddle point, but this is the shape. Let's look at these cross sections. If we cut it with the XY plane, check out what we get. See that? That's cutting it with the ground. Okay, and now let, let's look at that from the top. So, so I can convince you that those are hyperbolas. Do you all see the hyperbolas? And then if we cut it with um, YZ plane, we get this. So if we look from this direction, those are parabolas, not hyperbolas, because there's only one of them, right? From the top, it was two of them opposite directions. So there we got parabolas and we cut it this way, we've got parabolas here. So when I took Cal 3, my professor was up there on the chalkboard trying to draw this stuff. I mean, just crazy. Can you imagine trying to draw a hyperbolic paraboloid on a chalkboard? You know, one color, that's all you get, one color, white chalk. It was frustrating. So we're very fortunate that we have the ability to visualize this stuff now, right? All right, so what is the equation of a hyperbolic paraboloid? Well, here it is. Man, that's really close to what we just looked at, isn't it? What's the only difference between this and what we just had before this? There's a subtraction sign rather than subtraction, addition. Subtraction, right? Subtraction. Okay, but hold on. So that's what tells me I'm going to be looking at a saddle. I've got two variables. They're both squared and then a third variable that's not. I've got subtraction between these two. Okay, so the variable that's not, Z, that's the direction of, I guess you could say that's the direction of the, how could you say is. Is that like the direction of, there's different ways to, to look at this. So maybe one of you can tell me, how do you want to look at the Z? What is the Z going to tell me? Like the previous one was a bowl, right? So it's easy to talk about the, the direction the bowl goes. Here, there's no like nice thing to orient in any direction. So how do we know Z, like how is Z different from the X and the Y directions? So the way I look at it is you have that two, um, two, par two parabolas back to back is backing away from the Z. Okay, so yeah, so the way, I think the best way to look at it, and that's, you said two parabolas, that's the, that's the way I think it's, it's easiest to consider it, is that if Z is the one that's not squared, then you're gonna have parabolas in the Z direction. So if we look from the side here, do you see it, how we have parabolas going up the Z? Right, but if we cut with another plane the other direction and come turn this way, we have parabolas going down the Z. So the, the, the variable that is not squared is the one which the parabolas are opening up and down on. The other slices are the hyperbolas. And so the hyperbolas don't go out the Z, right? The hyperbolas are going away running parallel to the XY plane. That's a tough one. Um, does that mean that like the vertex is always zero for these parabolas? No, because each parabola is different, okay. right? So let me bring the parabolas back up. So do you see that? So what we're doing is we're slicing this. Um, when we do a trace, okay? So when I do a trace, what I have to do is I have to fix a value. Here I fix a value of Y. So I fix a value Y, maybe I choose Y is 10. So then what I do is I plug 10 in here for Y, right? And then what I'll have then is a parabola because I'll have Z here and then I'll have X squared here, that'll be a parabola. And so that's, that's just one of these parabolas. Let me back that up. Let me back that up, there we go, uh, a little too far. Okay, right there. So right here where that plane hits, 
where that plane hits is one specific parabola. That's only one, right? So it has a certain vertex. But if I change my y, my y value and come a little bit further out to the right, I'm going to have a different parabola and then a different one. Yeah, Each yeah. one of my traces is, is, is a different, unique parabola. The, the thing that makes it a hyperbolic paraboloid is the fact that it creates, traces create parabolas and hyperbolas, depending on which way you slice, but they are all different. Does that kind of clarify it? Yes. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Oh, wait, hold on. That was, that was x squared minus y squared, right? And then equals z. But we could have different variations of that, couldn't we? We could have x squared over a squared minus z squared over b squared equals y over c. So now the y is the one that's not squared. And that means the direction of the y-axis is where we're going to have the parabolas. Oh, not that one. So our parabolas are going to go um, kind of up and down the y-axis. Again, not super important. What I'm going to do at the end of all this, I'm going to give you an equation. And I'm just going to ask you, what type of surface is this? I'm not going to ask you to draw it. I'm just going to ask you, what type of surface is this? All right. All right. Um, yeah, here's another variation of it where it comes kind of down the x-axis this time. All right, a cone, next one. So a cone, this is a cone, all right? So when we slice a cone, we're either gonna get ellipses or, let's see, let's just look at them all. We're gonna get a bunch of ellipses if we slice it with um, traces that are parallel to the xy plane. We're gonna get, here we get hyperbolas, and then from this direction, we also get hyperbolas. And here's the equation. All variables are present. All variables are squared. You have addition between two of the variables and the other variables on the other side. So if you have this scenario, the variable that's on, that is by itself over here, that's the direction the cone goes. So here the, the cone kind of goes up the z-axis and down the z-axis. The z being on the right side by itself is what tells you that. If the x squared was on that side and the z squared was on the left, then it would go down the x-axis. I'll show you those, all right? So that's that, let's see here. Here we go, this one's going down the y-axis. So you should expect to see the y squared on the right side. And then you could have it come down the x-axis. So you should expect to see the x squared on the right side. You have to have pluses here, though. This has got to be a plus between these for this to be a cone. All right, we're almost done. Now we're talking about another surface called a hyperboloid of one sheet. A hyperboloid of one sheet. There it is. That is a hyperboloid of one sheet. I'm not sure what that looks like. To me, that's always looked like, have you ever seen like nuclear power plants have that kind of shaped thing? That's kind of what it looks like to me, but all right, let's look, take a look at the equation. Wow, that's almost the what equation, almost. All variable squared equals one. Sphere. Sphere, yes, yes. But the sphere, cone. you have to have A, B, and C all be the same. Which one? The cone one. The ellipsoid. Cone would have this on the other side, but there wouldn't be a one there. So that's a good, I'm glad Adam brought that up. Look, if this one wasn't here, then we can move that to the other side, right? The Z squared to the other side, and that would be a cone. But there is a one there. So if you brought the z squared over, it wouldn't be just the z squared over c squared, it'd be z squared over z, eh, z squared over z, can't say it, z squared over c squared plus one, and that would not be a cone. So 
but it, there was something we looked at that had all three together all over like a squared, b squared, c squared equals one, but this was not a minus, it was a plus. The, the ellipsoid. 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 So it's almost the ellipsoid, almost the ellipsoid, but it's not. And because there's a minus there, this is what it looks like. So it's a hyperboloid of one sheet. We call it, that's what it's called, a hyperboloid of one sheet. And do you see that the variable that has the negative on it, the z squared, that's kind of the direction it opens, right? It kind of goes up this way, like through the, the z axis and down this way like that, like along the z axis. So if we were to change this and put this, make it minus x squared and put the z squared here, it should go down the x axis or similarly down the y. I can change like this A, B, and C, I can change these to show you how it changes the shape. So if I change A, it does something. Change B, it change, you know, it looks like something else. Change C. Yeah. Weird. Weird shape. Hold on. Gotta sneeze. Okay, almost there. Oh, we, we need the other cases, sorry. I keep forgetting that I have, this is it down the y-axis. This is it down the x-axis. All right, last one, hyperboloid of two sheets. All three variables are present. All three variables are present. All of them are squared, equals one. But now you have two of them are negative and one of them is positive. Instead of two of them being positive and one of them negative. I don't know if y'all can tell from this, but do y'all see that this is just this? But let me evaluate this. Get it back to its normal state. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There we go. So do y'all see that if I made this more, more and more narrow, right? Just kind of like, imagine putting, putting like a belt around this and tightening the belt. Eventually it would just, it would like snip it off in the middle and I'd get like two pieces. And that's exactly what we're looking at now. The hyperboloid of two sheets, we've, we've snipped off, we've snipped off the middle part. And so you've got this, like a bowl on top and a bowl on the bottom. And how are we gonna remember that it's, it's kind of going up the Z and down the Z? How do we remember that? Well, it's, Z is the one that has the positive sign on it. Okay, so if Z has the positive on it, then that's the direction it's gonna go. If we have the Y has the positive, then it's gonna go like out sideways down the y-axis, and then if the x has it, it's going to go both directions along the x-axis. All right. Any questions? Um, <clears throat> in the cone, would it also be able to, would you be able to consider that also as a hyperboloid of two sheets or? Well, or not? cone has lines when it intersects, right? So like when you look at, were you saying hyperboloid of one sheet or two? The two sheet. Okay, so think about this right here, okay? If I cut through, not that way, let's go this way. So I'm coming through with things that are parallel to the YZ plane. So YZ, if I look at it from this direction, I have, I have a hyperbolas. Do you see that little, it's like a parabola this way, a parabola that way. If we go back to cone and look at the same direction and we cut here, right? We will have hyperbolas, right? We will have hyperbolas, but that these are, you have like a line, right? Let's see if I can bring this in here. Those are, those are ellipses. Those are, 
I guess the thing that makes it not a cone is that this is a straight, do you see that this is straight? Right, do you see how that's a straight line? Yeah. And when you go to the hyperboloid two sheets, this is not straight, it's curved. So it's more of a bowl than it is like a funnel. Yeah, so that that's a big deal because it's almost like you could say that the cone is almost like linear because it's straight lines and this is nonlinear. So they are they are distinct enough that they can't be the same thing. They're close, but they're not. And you can tell by the equation, right? I mean, the equations are very, very similar, right? But there's slight differences. Again, this cone does not have the one in there, right? The equals one, where the other one does. Right there. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So now let's get to let's get get down to business. So what am I going to want you to be able to do? So let's say we're given this x squared. Let me take this to a different place so I can. Hey, what's going on? All right, so we are given a, an equation. We're in three-dimensional space. We want to reduce it to standard form of one of the surfaces discussed in this section and classify the surface. So I put include all details about traces and direction of surface opening, et cetera. So let's just work through this and, and see what happens. So we have, we have x squared equals 2y squared plus three Z squared. And I, I'm gonna open up the book right now. Give me a moment. It's going to take me a second to open this up because I want you to see a specific page in the book that'll make life a little easier, I think. what do y'all think of that game last night? Where are all my, where are all my uh, KC fans? No, crickets, crickets. Was it a good game? It was. Well, kind of. Was it entertaining? I was. I was for the Bucks, so I found it to be somewhat entertaining. My my best friend did not. He was a KC fan. He was not happy. All right. So here we go. Let me get to this here. In the ebook, where is it? Okay, right here, table one. Wow, it's, it's not letting me. Wow, okay, so here this table. This gives you a summary of all of the different things we can have, okay? It doesn't have a sphere in here, all right? But here it is. So let's let's use this to see if we can't figure out what's going on here. Man, I missed the, They used to have a different version of the ebook that was basically just like a PDF version of the book. And now they have this more interactive thing and I think it's I don't like it. That's just me personally. All right, so let's let's go to this. I'm looking at this. I've got I've got all three variables squared, right? got all three variables squared. So that's going to automatically eliminate some things. It could be an ellipsoid, right? It cannot be an elliptic paraboloid because this has um, a Z, not Z squared. So it can't be this, can't be this. Could be a cone, right? Could be a cone because all three are squared. Could be this because all three are squared, could be this, all right? So we've eliminated two things it could be. Now, I'm going to try and get the x squared, uh, x squared, y squared, z squared to, to be by themselves and not have coefficients. So watch what I do here. I'm going to go x squared equals, you just tell me if you agree with this or not. Okay. 
And that's a little tricky because all I'm doing is I'm rewriting y, two times y squared. Let's look at that one. I'm reading, rewriting that as one over, I'm sorry, y squared over one half because that's the same thing, right? And then I'm trying to get it into the form of the, the, uh, the sheet that I'm looking at. So this, this has to be something squared, like a squared. So I take the square root of it and square it. Okay, so that looks like I have like y squared over something squared plus z squared over something squared. Do y'all understand that? Do I need to clarify any of that? And I could even look at the other side as being x squared over one squared. All right, do we have anything that looks like that, where you've got two variables on one side being squared, added together, the other side is just the variable, I'm uh, sorry, the variable squared, no plus one or anything like that? It's the yes, cone. Uh, cone. It's cone, right here. It's this cone right here. You've got one of the variables squared over number squared equals um, x squared over number squared plus y squared. This is it, this is a cone. Now. Here with this one, because the Z is the one isolated, the cone goes up the Z axis and down the Z axis. Is that what we have? And we have X, right? So this, this cone should come out the X axis and back. So, all right, what, here we've reduced it in the standard form. It looks like X squared over A squared equals Y squared over B squared plus z squared over c squared. So that is standard form right there. I know what a, b, and c are. Classify the surface, part b. It's a cone. And I'm going to put here opens out the x-axis. And that's just a rough, I don't have to go into more detail. That just kind of explains to you that this cone goes out the x-axis in both directions, right? That's it. Any questions there? Ready for the next so one? So when it, when it says classify the surface, would we have to put the traces or do we just put cone? No, just put cone. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I wanted to hear about include details about the traces is for you to tell me um, traces are hyperbolas and um, ellipses, but it's okay. You don't need to, you don't need to put that, all right? It's a cone. This cone is good enough for me. All right, let's look at the next one. Really weird. Why don't I give you a minute to work on that on your own? Uh, let me see if I can get both on, up on the same screen for you. I right, see, this is why I don't like this. Why do they have to do this? Why can't they just, okay, maybe full book? What happens if I click on full book? What the heck? I don't think that's helping. Y'all are, are looking at that right now, right? You're just trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's very dumb. So let's see, maybe there's something else I can do here. Wish I could make this bigger. This is dumb. This is where technology, people are just trying too hard to make it better and it winds up being worse. Y'all are figuring this out, right? While I'm sitting here talking to myself. Y'all are trying to figure out what this is. Yeah. Okay, let me make that. I'm just gonna make that big again. Mm. 
here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find my phone. I'm going to just take a quick picture of this. Uh, that's not very good. I'll get I'll get I'll get an electronic version for you. That's nice. I'll do a nice scan of this page, and uh, that way you have a quick way of referencing. Anybody have any ideas though on this one? Hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay. So what did you do first? Did you tell me what you did to this? I moved the squared variables to the other side first. Okay. So you moved. The y squared, so you isolated the 4x, you move the y squared over and the other one. Okay. And to get the squared on their own, I, I, is it okay to use a common denominator instead of the other thing? Because that's what I do. How did you do it then? I, well, the, I, there's a common denominator of, that I could find of 12 by making four times three. Okay. So multiply the entire thing by one over 12. You did one twelfth on both sides. We end up with x over three equals y squared over twelve minus z squared over four. That okay, so let's see. Equals y squared over twelve minus z squared over four. What do y'all think? That work? Okay, that's fine. If I were doing it, what I would have done with this is I just would have rewritten this as x over one fourth, because that's really four x, equals y squared over one squared, because that's really just y squared. Then I, I would have done minus um, z squared over one over root three squared. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's the same equation, all right? If you multiply through by one twelfth now, you'll get the same thing that um, Benjamin had. All right, the important thing is to note that you've got a all three variables, two of them are squared, you've got subtraction between two of them. So what is this, Benjamin, were you able to get that part? It's a hyperbolic paraboloid. Hyperbolic paraboloid, so let's take a look here. Hyperbolic paraboloid, I gotta make this bigger. Hyperbolic paraboloid, you've got one of the variables over a number, no squared, equals the other two variables, squared and subtraction. So this is the weird one where you've got parabolas, right? That are gonna go in the Z, in this case, the Z direction. So all you'd have to say here is hyperbolic paraboloid, and I'd be happy. All right, we have another one to do. Were there any questions on where that came from? Hyperbolic paraboloid. All right, this is the last one of the section, last problem. I'm gonna let you think about it for a few minutes. I don't know what he wants us to do. We have to turn this into one of the standard forms. This is one of those weird things back from like uh, pre-cal that we were able to do in two dimensions where you could, uh, if you like rewrite it, 
or at least the start of it, if you rewrite it, putting all the variables together. Um, I forgot the name of what it is, but you take... Uh, completing the square. Yeah, you do completing the square for all the parts, and then that'll set you up for the standard form. It's my nemesis. Did I trick y'all? Did y'all think I was a student? Does it, was that, did that work? No, I knew that was you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good though. So on this one, we don't have, um, we actually don't have any form that we've seen because it has all three variables all squared, but then it has all the X, Y, Z's in there too, right? So this is tricky. You just, you just have to complete the square first. So um, you're gonna take all your X's, put them together. You put your Y's together, put your Z's together. And then I'll just leave the two there. And then you're gonna have to complete the square here complete the square here, complete the square here. So how about on the yellow? Would that be hard to do? Um, plus minus one. Yep, plus and minus one. And okay, what about on the green? We have to be a little careful on the green. What about that minus in front of the y squared? I would do this. I would take a, a negative out of both of these and then complete the square on this. Because remember, for completing the square, you have to have a coefficient of one. Make sense? So, and then on the last one, that one I can just do z squared plus 4z and then take half of that square and add subtract so plus 4 minus 4 and then we still have plus 2. We did completing the square way back right in the beginning what three weeks ago so um, I expect that you are somewhat comfortable with this like I said the only part that I think is tricky is this one right here because you're going to do the minus and then you'll do it's like y squared minus two y, and then you'll here, you'll add and subtract one. Complete it, which makes it that. So take these three factors down to this, then minus one, and then distribute your negative back through. So that's what this all turns out to be. And then here, you'll have the x uh, minus one squared, that's these three, then you still have minus one. And then you do those three turn into z plus two squared, but you still have minus four and then plus two. Okay, who needs me to clarify something there? You sure? We haven't talked about this yet, so this should be a little bit strange. What number do you get here? Ones go away. Minus two, right? So I'm gonna take that to the other side as a two. Is everybody okay with this? Now's a good time to ask a question. So I want you to remember back when, you know, in two dimensional space, if we have X squared plus Y squared equals like nine, that's a circle of radius three. But if you have something like X minus one squared plus Y minus four squared equals nine, that's still a, a circle of radius three, but we've moved it, right? We've shifted the center of that. The center of this would be now at one four, wouldn't it? That's where it would be centered. This is the same thing, okay? So just because I have X minus one, Y minus one, z plus two, all that means is that whatever shape this is, whatever surface this is, we've moved it, okay? It's been shifted. So we really would just wanna focus on the fact that we've got all three things are squared. So all three variables appear, they're all squared. We do have subtraction between two, 
two of, um, we do have subtraction on one of them. We have equals two. Hmm. What do y'all think? You just divide it all by two to get the one. Okay, so let's do that. Let's divide everything by two. Two here, two here, two here, two here. And so now we have x minus one squared over, um, I could look at that as being root two squared minus y minus one squared over again, root two squared plus uh, z plus two squared over root two squared equals one, right? Do we have anything that's like that? A hyperloid. What is it? Hyper what? Hyperloid of one sheet. Hi, hi, yeah, hyperboloid of one sheet. Hyperboloid of one sheet. All three, all three appear here. They're all squared. They're divided by some numbers equals one. We got subtraction on one of the two variables. And in this particular case, our subtraction occurs on the y. So you don't need to do this, but it's going to be like a, um, a funnel kind of that way, like that, down the y-axis. Oh, like that. Um, and it, so it's a hyperboloid of one sheet. And then now this, you don't need to put this, but because it's, this thing doesn't really have a center the way a sphere has a center, right? The way an ellipsoid has a center, but we could say that it's been kind of centered somewhere other than the origin. So this point one, one, negative two that comes from these kind of gives us this, it's not really a center, but it kind of just tells us what the shift is, right? Everything got shifted, you know, X by one, Y by one, and Z down too. So everything got moved. All right, that's it for this section. It's about recognition of powers on variables and subtractions and things like that. It's a, it's a pretty blah section to me. I'm not a real big fan of that section, but we do need to talk about it, so. All right, we still have about 12 minutes. Are there any questions? I wanted to maybe just start to introduce the next section, unless you all had anything you wanted to, to ask or for me to entertain at this point. Uh, can I take a screenshot of all the work you just did for example six, the one yep. we just finished? And remember, I am, um, I am sending all these now, or not sending, I am posting whatever I write here in OneNote. Um, I, am, I am posting on our website under files, class files. It says something like Zoom. Oh, okay, Zoom recording. class lecture notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would, now the thing is it doesn't take, it, it doesn't do everything. It's just the things that I bring into OneNote copy and paste in here when I work through the problem. So if you want to see everything, you have to watch the video to see it all. But I'll leave that up there if you want to screenshot that. Any other questions or comments or anything? Okay, let's get started in the next session. I know it's 10 minutes, but you know, you'll be begging for time later. So we may as well. All right, so 10.7, vector functions and, and space curves. So we're finally ready to start doing some calculus. And a lot of what I'm about to show you is visual. So that's why we're gonna just kind of go through this quickly. All right, so a vector function, what is a vector function? We've actually seen vector functions already. I gave you an example of a vector function, r of t equals r naught plus tv. That was the ver first vector function that we ever were introduced to, but I didn't really stress that it was a vector function. Basically, it was a function that took in some value here, t, took in a number and it spit out a vector, right? So like here, if I do what's r of, let's say one, 
all I'm going to do is replace the T with one. And then I get whatever R naught is, some vector plus some vector, which is still a vector, right? So it takes, it takes in a number and spits out a vector, right? It takes in a number, spits out a vector. Here's, here's the way that we could imagine what's going on here. You take in a number, a number comes in. So when you think about functions, maybe I should back up. When we think about functions in college algebra, what we normally had was this drawing. You remember this, like way back in college algebra, you had this drawing of a function f, and we called this the domain, and this was the range, kind of, right? So, if, for example, if you had the function f of x equals the square root of x, then it would take the number one and it would send it over to number one. It would take the number four and send it over to two, and it would take number nine and send it over to three. But there are certain numbers here you couldn't plug in, right? Like you couldn't plug in negatives. But you had a number going in, number coming out, right? So what we said back in, in college algebra, but we didn't stress this to you, is that this function f takes a number off the real number line, r, and sends it into a new, another number. So the function f in college algebra took a number in and sent it to a new number, right? A vector function takes in a real number and spits out a vector. So that's a little different. That's a little different. That, I, I want to erase this uh, page here, but I'll, I'll just give you a moment in case you need to write that down. Um, a vector, a function r of, r of t, that's the vector r of t equals f of t comma g of t or r of t equals f of g, g of t, h of t, where t is a real number and f, g, and h are re real value functions is called a vector function or a vector value function. So the idea here, I'm gonna clear this, is that we now have this function r. It's going to take things in and spit things out, but it's not doing numbers to numbers. It's doing numbers to vectors. And that's very different than what we've done in the past, right? So it could take a number in and spit out a two-dimensional vector. That would be this case. Or we could take a number in and spit out a three-dimensional vector. So this vector function r could take a number in and spit out a two-dimensional vector, which would mean it goes from one dimension to two. Or it could take a number in and spit something out in three-dimensional space. Does that make sense to you, that notation? R is going to take a number in and spit out a two-dimensional vector, or it's going to take a number in and spit out a three-dimensional vector. All right. So with that in mind, these things right here that are in, in the vector tell you what each component turns out to be. Uh, let's do, let's just move on in the notes. Okay, so this is me saying the domain of this, just real numbers and the range is just vectors. All right, so when we're given a vector function, the things in here in the vector that tell you what to do, these are called the component functions of the vector function. All right, so if you have a two dimensional vector coming out, you're gonna have two component functions. If you have a three-dimensional vector, you'll have three component functions. It's either f and g, or it's f, g, and t, uh, f, g, and h. That's just language. Okay, the graph, the graph of, of a two-dimensional or three-dimensional um, vector function will be a curve in two or three-dimensional space. Let me say that again. When you have a vector function, takes in a number, spits out a vector, whether or not it spits out a vector in 2D or 3D, it will always draw a curve. It will not draw a surface. Do you understand that? That's what this is saying. Vector functions draw, oops. Vector functions draw curves, all right? That's what they do. Now, we have to be a little loose with the word curve here. A straight line will be considered to be a curve, all right? 
it's straight line, but it's a it's still considered a curve. Should we, should we uh, take a look? Here's an example of our first vector function that I'm going to show you here. It is the vector function r of t equals t squared comma one minus t cubed. So let's just let's just play with this. If I say what's r of zero, you're plugging in zero into this. You're just going to do zero squared, which is zero, and then do one minus zero, which is one. Right? That's r of zero. Let's do one more. What's r of one? Let's see. R of one is we plug in one, we get one squared is one, and then one minus one cubed, that's going to be zero. Right? So look at T as a clock running in the background. Okay, T is nowhere on our graph. And that's, that's a super important distinction to make. Back in college algebra, in pre-cal, in Cal 1, in Cal 2, pretty much when we had a function, right? The input here would be X and the output is Y. We always visualize the X. The input could be visualized. If X is one, one squared is one. If X is two, the output is four, right? Then we have our problem. The X axis was our input. The Y axis was our out. So do you see that in our standard graph from college algebra up through all the calculus we've done, you can always see the input and output together. But here in this vector function, the input is not, um, there is no, uh, representation of the input on the graph. It's a clock in the background. So when we start the clock at t equals zero, right, at t equals zero, we start the clock, where are we? We're at this vector, zero, one. Do you all see that this is that vector? Zero, one. Just goes up one. But as I let the clock run, Here we're at one, okay? So here we're at one, when we get to one, we're at the vector one, zero. So that's the vector one, zero. And then as I continue to let the time run, it keeps drawing me vectors, right? So you wanna look at it like a clock running. So that's really good at kind of representing maybe some particle moving through space, right? But at each point in time, you know, just stop anywhere, boom, right there at point three, it's a vector came out. All right, let's move on. Any questions? This was just a random function. I just came up, I could have come up with anything. You can put anything you want in here for these component functions, anything. Okay, look at this one. This is a vector valued function that has as an input t, and I do put a restriction here, I do say t is greater than zero. So we're only gonna pl plug in positive or zero and positive numbers. And here it is, it spits out a three dimensional vector. Cosine t, sine t, t over five. Hmm. Let's talk about, let's talk about the I'm almost out of time. Cosine t sine t. Let's just talk about that. What would happen if I plug in zero into this? Let's see what this vector would look like. If I plug in zero, what's cosine of zero? One. 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 Sine of zero? Zero. Zero. And then let's go ahead and plug in there to get one fifth, right? Now I'm gonna have you plug in some, some values that are nice values. So like pi over six, let's just plug in pi over six because that's a value we should know cosine and sine. So uh, what's cosine of pi over six? It's one over square root of three or two over square root of three. Mm, pi over six is 30 degrees. Should be root three over two. Sine should be a half. And then this number will just be some number. Okay, I'm out of time. 
here's, here's what you need to kind of get from this. When you have cosine T and sine T here, when you start letting T grow, what this does in two dimensional space, what this does is it starts out right here and then it starts drawing all the dots along the unit circle. That's what happens as T starts varying, starting at zero. You start getting all the different important dots that go around the unit circle. And then it keeps on going and it comes all the way back around. When you get to two pi, it gets to here and then it keeps and it does it again and it keeps doing it, all right? But at the same time, this is three dimensional. So look at what's happening to our Z coordinate. As T gets bigger, this fraction gets bigger, doesn't it? Anyone have any idea what this thing looks like? It's gonna be a giant spring. It's like a spring. So I'm gonna show it to you here. Here it is. From the top looking down, it's just a circle. It keeps on trying to draw the unit circle. But you have the Z component starts adding height to it. So as you play the clock here, start going around, right? Drawing the circle, but the Z keeps coming up. And so you create this spring. So what you can see, and we gotta go, is that now we can start looking at some really cool things in three dimensional space and then start asking about tangent lines and things like that. But that'll come next time. All right, everybody have a great day. Um, You've got plenty of stuff to work on, I think. You can do all your homework through 10-6, and then you have that other take-home exam if you want to get started on that. All right, everyone. Have a good one. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. All right. Have a nice day, Professor. Thank you. Questions? If you have questions, I'll stay here for a minute.